Hi, Debbie here, and before I get started today, I want to mention that there's a blog hop going on over on my blog, and you can find all the details of the hop on my blog post, which I'll leave a link down below this video. So let's get started. I'm going to be using the Organics Fruit Stamp Set today. It does come with matching dyes, but I'll not be using those this time. Firstly, let's talk about the elephant in the room this massive watercolour palette I have. I don't recommend this palette for the majority of people. It's heavy and bulky and gets in the way a lot on my desk. But what it does do is give me a big mixing area so that I can demonstrate how I mix watercolours and give you an idea as to water to paint ratio. This video has been requested many times and so I hope you find it helpful. Again, do not go out and buy this palette. I will link a lovely inexpensive palette below that I started out with and is a great option. However, an even better one than that is a white dinner plate. That is effectively what this is, a large flat dinner plate with paint wells around the edge. Before I get onto painting, I spritz the palette with a fine mist of water to help reactivate the paints for when I want to use them in a few minutes time. I then moved on to stamping out my design. I used a piece of Fabriano Artistico Extra White Cold Press Watercolour Card and I chose the pear image from the Organic Fruit Set and stamped it in Gina K Whisper Amalgam Ink. I stamped it several times in order to get a sufficient outline to work with. I also stamped a selection of leaves around the pear. Where they overlapped with the pear, I masked off with painter's tape. I stamped the pear and leaves as if they were hanging on a branch and I drew a knobbly branch in with pencil to connect them. I then take the watercolour card to a board. This will help to keep the card flat and prevent it from warping too much when I add lots of water painting the background. If you don't do watery backgrounds then you can skip this step but I'm never quite sure where my painting will take me and so I prepare for all eventualities. With a paper tape down I started to paint. If you've seen my cards and videos before, then you will know that my preference is for a muted palette. When mixing my colours, I don't clean off the palette, but start from an area which has a similar colour to that which I'm mixing. In this case, I wanted a deep rich brown for the knobbly underside of the leaf branch. I drew along my pencil lines, keeping my movements loose and slightly random for a natural knobbly look. I mixed up a more concentrated paint to water ratio for a deeper colour and ran this around some of the branch edges. I then rinsed my brush slightly and pulled the paint out over the rest of the branch with the damp brush. This gives a lighter colour to the top of the branch where the light would be hitting it. One of my favourite greens is Perylene Green and all the colours I used are Daniel Smith watercolours. Perylene Green is a great starting point as you can see. I like to use what's left on my palette I mix the perylene green in with remnants of the last green colour and from there determined where I was at. I dipped into some green gold to lighten and brighten the green a little and then started painting. I painted directly to the paper with a green mix and then washed out and spread the green out with a damp brush to the leaf edges. This way the darkest colour is concentrated at the base of the leaf where the shadows are and as such deeper darker colours are more naturally found. Getting the water to paint ratio right is so important. I've heard people talk about the mixes in various terms, such as it is a light double cream, single cream, full fat milk, and also various sources and such. For me, I try to keep in mind that the more concentrated the paint mixture, the slower the paint will move when added to water. So if you place a layer of water down and then touch a brush full of paint to that area, you will see the paint rapidly move out through the water. Then that mixture will be one with a reasonable amount of water in it. Whereas if the brush was loaded with a more concentrated mix, the paint would move more slowly and gradually out from the point where the brush touches the water. There are lots of videos on Instagram and if you check out some fabulous sea paintings, then look up Cindy Lane who has the most amazing control of paint to water. I'll leave a link um, below to Cindy. Thinking of water, one of the things to look for is how much water you have on the paper. If you have a puddle of water and then add paint to it, it looks like one of those paint droplet videos you see going into a water jar. 
the paint moves into the water in a sort of cloud-like way. However, if you wait until the water on the surface has dried off a bit, so that there is no longer a puddle but more of a soft sheen, then you will then when you add the paint, you will get some lovely blending and movement of the paint from that point. So regarding water, think about how much water is in the paint mixes and how much water is already on your surface. I know it sounds like a lot to think about, but even when you're impatient and get in there too quickly, then the results can still be amazing because with watercolour, you never can tell what's going to happen. Keeping all the things I'm telling you in mind will help, but you can never fully control watercolour. And because of those wonderful, unexpected bleeds, blooms and blends, I never want to fully control it. One of the wonders of watercolours is their ability to layer over one another. Their translucency means that the colours below affect the colours painted on top. And so for the pair, I started with a layer of nickel azo yellow, which I planned would give a warm glow to the colours I added on top. I used the wet and wet technique to add more paint and therefore a deeper, richer colour in places, whilst keeping other areas as light as possible in order for these to be highlights on the fruit where the light hits the surface more so than elsewhere. Painting in this way gives much more of a 3D realistic feel to the fruit, while at the same time the brushwork keeps things a little looser and not too representational. I slowly built up the layers, fussing away as I do, adding touches of extra depth here and there, and also using a damp but relatively dry brush to lift away the paint from the highlight areas. At first this pair was too bright for me, but as time went on and I was able to mute the overall colour, while still that initial yellow layer gives the fruit an extra pop in comparison to the leaves. I say this again and again, but what brings an image to life is having a range of values from deep dark shadows to brighter highlights. Sometimes I see fabulous colouring, but it's all a bit samey, with lots of mid-value and not using the shadows and highlights that would make such a difference. Look up a Berto Gather on Instagram and you will see what a difference getting the values right makes. He really does have an amazing touch. His shadows are often almost black and his highlights the lightest of shades. But in between he fits those mid-value colours. The range from darkest to lightest really makes his images sing. I'm going to play some music now while I continue to add layers to the pear and the leaves and I'll be back shortly to finish off this card. Thank you. 
The mix for the background was, again, a bit of what was left on my palette, plus I know there was a small blob of Mayhem Blue on the side which formed the main colour, although I did mute the blue down by adding a touch of orange in the form of Transparent Red Oxide. Being opposite each other on the colour wheel, adding a little of one to the other neutralises the colour and creates some of the muted shades I love. You'll see me doing this often, adding a bit of red to green to just knock it back a bit and create the emotional colour palette that speaks to me. I'm continuously going back in with deeper shades for depth and shadows and the background was still wet in places and the colours of the branch and leaves bled together but for me that is one of those happy accidents that I just love and gives the looser look to the painting rather than everything being inside the lines. I added some stippling with a small brush to represent the slightly pitted texture of the pear skin but as I was doing it I knew I'd prefer to get my splatter on. Since I've been filming more videos I've been squeezing white gouache onto my wet surface using it and then wiping it up afterwards but this seems so wasteful. You can re-wet gouache although it doesn't always have the same opacity as when fresh out the tube but from now on I'm going to use a small palette um, give it a go for keeping my white gouache and perfect pearls mixes in and hopefully this will be less wasteful. Even though I'd added my splatter I still wasn't totally happy and couldn't resist a little more depth of colour here and there. Eventually I told myself to let it go and when the panel was dry I cut it down with a guillotine. I tend to do this in small cuts at a time slowly reducing the size of the panel until it fits in this case on an A2 card base. But cutting it bit by bit, I get a better chance of placing the pear just where I want it. With me, it's always about the main image, and I often forget about the sentiment until the last minute. I'd already added the finished panel to a Desert Storm card base with foam tape before I thought about what sentiment I wanted to add. I had in mind possibly a die cut, but eventually the sentiments in the organic fruit set worked really well, and so I carefully stamped one of the greetings onto the panel in Nocturne ink using a Misty. I'd never be able to do this without the Misty, as I stamped the sentiment a couple of times to get a good impression on the textured card, and with it already being mounted onto a card base too. I finished off with Seabreeze Nouveau Droplets and Eggshell Pearls, and so that completes this card with a slightly more zoomed out look at how I mix colours and chatting about the paint to water ratio and how to make that work for you. I'll link products that I've used today below this video. This stamp set is part of a new release from Simsa Stamp and that's what the blog hop is all about. So pop on over to my blog for more details. Thanks for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. And if you want to see more, I've put two videos up on screen for you to check out. Thanks and I'll see you next time.